Infection is basically a disease which is caused by infective agent, what we call as pathogens. They live around us, everywhere. But some pathogens, once they get entry into our body, they start multiplying and then they start causing the illness. The infection, it can be very mild, but it can be very serious. And in some conditions, it can lead to organ damage and even death. Welcome back viewers to Faith and Discipline podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Muhammad Ilyas. He is acute consultant. Welcome Dr. Ilyas to Faith and Discipline podcast. Thank you. Thank you for another opportunity to come back to the forum. Thank you. So um, I want to know about infection because there are a lot of people who get infected due to different reasons. So what is infection and why it causes a problem? Okay. So that's a very important and basic question. Uh, infection is basically a disease which is caused by infective agent, what we call as pathogens. So when the pathogens, they live around us everywhere. But some pathogens, once they get entry into our body, they start multiplying and then they start causing the illness. And that is what we call it infection. Okay. Um, the infection, it can be very mild, just like sometimes we have sore throat due to virus infection. Uh, but they, it can be very serious and in some conditions it can lead to organ damage and even death. Okay, so is it only humans who get infected or other species also get infected? And if they do, and as a human, if we consume that uh, species, uh, what happens? Do we get infected from it? So again, yes, that's important from prevention point of view. Um, but the infection is not only limited to human beings. Even animals can also get infected. Birds can also get infected. Uh, and these, some of these infections, they can be transmitted from these species to human beings. And these group of diseases we call as zoonosis, which means animal infections which are transmitted to human beings. And there are about 200 diseases which can be transmitted from animals to human beings. Uh, one of the common examples you can see is that they can come from like even pets, like cat scratch disease. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so this, as the name suggests, is basically an infection which is transmitted to human beings through the cat bite or scratch. And uh, then there are serious infections like brucellosis. Okay. They can come from pigs. Mm -hmm. And then there are infections which can be transmitted to the meat. Mm -hmm. um, so some of them are, can be very potentially harmful and serious. Okay. And one of the examples that coming to my mind is bird flu. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So there are viral infections like from common birds. They can be transmitted from chicken. You, you might have, you might remember the swine flu mm -hmm. outbreak okay. and there was like uh, another outbreak, uh, Middle East respiratory virus, yeah. which was trans uh, transmitted from camels and cattle to human beings. What are the possible factors that make play a role in infecting us? So again, uh, as I said, the infective agents are around us. Even in the, on the human body, you have lots of bacteria, millions of them. And they are our friends mostly, <laughs> what we call as a normal microbial flora of the human body. Uh, but there are certain things which change, they can cause an infection, which can then lead to other illnesses. So there, what we call as, uh, if, you, if you want to understand, it's called the chain of infection. Okay. It's a kind of a process which leads to infective disease. So chain of infection always starts with the infective agent. Is the bug which causes the infection, which could be bacteria, could be virus, could be fungus, could be parasite. Okay. And then that bacteria or virus, it needs to live somewhere, mm. which we call as reservoir. Mm. And it's the environment where they actually flourish. Okay. And that can be sometimes human body itself. Mm. So we have some bugs which live in our throat, mm. in our stomach, in our gut. Mm. So that's our reservoir. And then once from the reservoir, the bug need to have a, an exit point. Okay. It's called a portal of exit. Okay. So, for example, it may reach, it is, if it is in an animal, it reaches to a system where it can get out of that body. For example, a urinary tract okay. or, for example, gut. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it is then transferred over to the other pers person through something what we call as vector. Mm -hmm. A vector is something which can carry. Okay 
from one kind of species to another sometime for the the easiest example i can give you is the mosquito All right. which carries what we call as plasmodium mm -hmm. and it causes malaria and it transfers to human body okay. and then from there it enters into the host and the host is like the in person which is being infected host itself had its own what we call as a defense mechanism which will fight against the infection but if those defense mechanisms are weakened to some reason, mm. then that infective agent will start multiplying and will cause the problems. Okay. So this is kind of a chain of infection. Okay. Um, and we, if we, if from the chain of infection, we say if we want to, if we want to prevent infection, mm. there are certain points where we can break this chain. Break the chain. Okay. And if we break the chain, we can control the infective process. Okay. Another example is re recently coronavirus that came, you know, allegedly came from bats. So that's another example. Example, yes, it's mm. common. Why the recently caused pandemic? So that was, yeah, that's very good example. So how serious um, can infection be for human beings? So, in as I said, there, there are certain things which we need to keep in mind. We, the infective diseases can present in a kind of a spectrum. It can be on one end of the spectrum, it can be very mild illness, okay. like a sore throat, sore throat. Okay. which settles down in a day or two, mm -hmm. taking paracetamol, mm -hmm. doing gargles, and you get feel better. Mm -hmm. On the other end of the spectrum, there is a serious life-threatening condition, which we call sepsis. Mm -hmm. So it can vary from mild infection to a serious life-threatening infection. Okay. Um, there are certain factors which are responsible mm -hmm. to determine the severity. Mm -hmm. Some of those factors are related to the bug itself okay. and some are related to the host itself. Oh. So you can say, you know, the, the one of the common in medical term which we call as pathogenicity, which means the ability of that bug to cause the illness okay. and the infection. Mm -hmm. That is related to the bug itself. Mm -hmm. And then there are host factors which could be the conditions which increases the likelihood of that person to get the infection and severe disease. Mm. That could be, for example, age. Mm. So very young age, like less than one year, mm. very old age, more than 75 or above, mm. they are more prone to get severe infection. Okay. Similarly, your, as we mentioned in chain of infection, your immune mechanisms, mm. so your body's ability to fight against infection, if they are weakened because of some reasons, for example, Patients may have underlying cancer, mm. they may be on medications like chemotherapy or they could be on medications like steroids which can make their immune system weak. Mm. They are more prone to get severe infection. Okay. Certain underlying medical conditions, mm. for example diabetes, mm. for example chronic kidney disease, liver disease, lung diseases like COPD, mm. those patients are more prone to get A recurrent infections and B could be serious infection. Okay. So you mentioned about sepsis, uh, which is obviously a very serious um, uh, infection. So what are the reasons for sepsis and how can we pre prevent ourselves from getting the sepsis? So first of the first of important thing is to understand what sepsis is mm. and how is it different from infection. So infection, as I said, is a process whereby the bug can enter into your body multiplies. Mm. In certain individuals, this process can lead to the severe form of infection, which can result in sepsis. Sepsis is a serious medical condition and potentially life-threatening, which results from infection. But when the bug enters into the body, the body starts an immune mechanism in order to fight the infection. As a result of it, it causes tissue damage and organ dysfunction. When the patient reaches to that stage, we call this patient has got sepsis. Okay. So it's a serious life-threatening condition due to dysregulated immune response mm -hmm. resulting in organ dysfunction and can lead to death as well. So we can say that our immune system, which is working for uh, our defenses, um, doesn't work properly. And then it attacks its, its own organs. It, 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 the immune system is doing its work, mm -hmm. but due to the infection, the it gets out of the control. control yeah. And then as a result of it, mm -hmm. the underlying triggering factor is still infection. infection. Okay. Now, 
how can we prevent it? The first part of the prevention or the first step is the recognition. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is to recognize that somebody has got sepsis. Okay. And sepsis is considered to be a, a life-threatening emergency. Okay. We see, like I work in acute medicine where we see patients coming in with sepsis, infections, mm -hmm. and we have to act quickly mm -hmm. to save their life. Okay. There is a, what we call as a, a kind of a protocol and the policy in all the hospitals in place where patients presenting with sepsis need to be assessed and treated within a very defined time frame. They need to have antibiotic within one hour. Okay. And they need to have this uh, process of assessment started as soon as they arrive in the hospital. Mm. Because that time is very critical in saving the life and preventing the complications of sepsis. The second other important thing is obviously the infect preventing the infection itself. Okay. So those are the things which will prevent sepsis. Mm. Um, so the, in in you know in terms of uh, what steps we can take to prevent infections mm -hmm. and the most important simple thing is good hand hygiene okay. then food hygiene because as we discussed there are some infections which can be transferred from there so uh, if a patient is presented to a &E, um, they are not feeling well how do you know the patient a got infection or they got a sepsis how do you um, differentiate between the two so that's a good question uh, so there are uh, what we call as the assessment systems in place mm -hmm. and they have been designed by the sepsis trust uk okay. and we call it as sepsis bundle mm -hmm. uh, basically it it includes the assessment of the parameters mm -hmm. which are which help us in recognition of the sepsis and also include the steps which we need to take okay. so the parameters could be simple for example temperature respiratory rate, mm. their oxygen levels, their blood pressure, okay. their conscious level, how they look. Mm. And this is kind of, you can say, translated into a simple measure called uh, NEWS2 scoring system, okay. which helps us in identifying what we call as a red flag sepsis. So, as you mentioned earlier, uh, one person can get infected from other other person. Um, and, um, you know, when you mentioned the chain. So, can um, we get sepsis from its victims? Can it spread to other people as well? So, well, you can't get sepsis from another patient. You can get infection from another patient. Okay. So, if you get infection from a person, mm -hmm. then that can lead to sepsis. Yeah. So, sepsis itself is, a, as we said, is the extreme end of the infected disease, which can lead to the complication. So that's to clarify for our viewers, like uh, they need to differentiate between the infection and the sepsis. So what are the treatment options for the sepsis? How do we treat sepsis? So well, first and most important thing, again, I would say is the prevention. Okay. Prevention is a very, very important thing uh, in avoiding the sepsis. Second is early recognition. The patient who had high temperature, they sometimes may have, especially an elderly patient, may have a low temperature. Okay. They have fast heart rate, they're breathing fast, mm. they have got a low conscious level, mm. they don't look well, and they may have an obvious source of infection, maybe like a rash, or maybe they're coughing up like green sputum and things like that. That patient, we should always think, could they have sepsis? And therefore, we need to initiate the right process which means getting the right help at the right time that's the two key important steps in the treatment of sepsis and obviously the third key treatment process is the assessment and the early treatment in the hospital which includes antibiotic therapy fluids oxygen and other medications so what are antibiotics because majority of the people they take antibiotics but they don't realize what they are and what is their use so antibiotics, broadly, we call them antimicrobials. Basically, they are the medications. They are one, one of the modern era medications, uh, which help in curing and containing and controlling the infection. That's the main kind of purpose of antibiotics. They can work against bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. Um, the first antibiotic, as you probably know, was uh, discovered in 1928. Um, 
accidentally in a lab. <laughs> but since then, there is there was a kind of uh, a, a rapid development of new antibiotics. Until 1968, we, we kind of uh, discovered around 14 new antibiotic agents. And then until 1986, there were additional five more antibiotics. And since then, nothing. So it started from penicillin and then it carried on. So um, taking antibiotics is okay to treat and fight against infections. But what is antibiotics misuse? Because that's very important to know for our viewers. That's a very, very key and important question. Antibiotic misuse is becoming like an important issue. Why? Because as I said, since 1986, we have not discovered any new agent for human use. So whatever antibiotics we have, we have to use them in a way that they remain effective. One of the key things which we need to remember is if the inappropriate use or misuse of antibiotic can lead to the loss of its effectiveness. And that can, that's what we call as antimicrobial resistance. This is becoming like an increasingly important issue, especially over the last 30, 40 years. Because we're not getting any more antibiotics. Mm. What we have, we have. Mm. And the bugs are getting clever with the time. Mm. Uh, so we need to be using them appropriately in a way that they can remain effective. So antimicrobial resistance is a serious issue. And there are now in UK and all over the world, there are guidelines available under the heading of antibiotic stewardship, which guide us how to use it, how to prevent the antimicrobial resistance, and then what can we do to make sure that they still remain effective. Um, why is it important to complete the antibiotic course? Because when uh, your GP prescribes you antibiotics, uh, you may start feeling better in a day or two. Should you stop or should you carry on? Uh, why is it important? It is very important. Uh, as I said, antimicrobial resistance. I, I would come to this or uh, um, answer this question by highlighting the factors which can lead to antibiotic resistance. So one of them is the first important thing, is it necessary to take antibiotic? That's the first and foremost important question. Because some simple infection like flu or cold can be just dealt with by using common therapies, paracetamol, fluids, rest. And then you don't need, if you do need, please do get assessment by your healthcare professional or get advice from your local pharmacist. If it is important or indicated to take antibiotic, then we need to take the antibiotic of the relevant, which, which is relevant to treat that infection. Mm. And thirdly, the dose should be what is required for, to deal with that infection. Taking too low dose or too high dose can create antimicrobial resistance. And it should be taken as it is prescribed. So if it is recommended to be taken for five days, it needs to be taken for five days. Too short course or too long course can also contribute to antibiotic resistance. It should be taken according to the recommended route of administration. Sometimes like in, you know, back in our countries, people prefer to take intravenous injection, mm. although oral antibiotic can work equally as good. Mm. So that can also lead to antimicrobial resistance. Okay. Uh, as you said, like antibiotics are good, but the course needs to be completed. But there, there are some side effects of antibiotics. So we need to be aware of those side effects before taking the antibiotics. So what are the side effects? So side effects, there are various groups of antibiotics. Um, the commonest ones we are, you know, we see that are the penicillins. The penicillin is a group of antibiotics that belong to beta lactamase. Then there are macrolide antibiotics. The commonest one is clarithromycin. If I, if I, if you want to if you want to highlight the side effect, penicillin's commonest side effects is the allergic reaction. And many times people are not actually allergic to it. It's just somebody said they probably are allergic to it. Very important to know whether they are truly allergic to it or whether it was just hearsay. Because by establishing that if they are truly allergic, we can go to alternative form. 
But if they're not, penicillin is a very effective borospectum antibiotic. Secondly, most commonly used are cephalosporins, as something like cephalexin, ceftriaxone. They can sometimes cause diarrhea, stomach upset, vomiting, and again, allergic reactions. Macrolides like clarithromycin, uh, their common side effect could be sickness and vomiting, and they sometimes can affect the liver. Tetracyclines are other form of antibiotics. Um, they are not recommended to be taken to pregnancy because they can have harmful effects on the baby. And then again, there are other antifungals, they have their own side effects, antivirals, they have their own side effects. There is a very long list, uh, but it depends which group of antibiotic you're using, for what infection, and what are the other patient factors which we need to be considered because some antibiotics, for example, may not, we may have to adjust either the dose or the form given the patient factors like kidney disease, liver disease. Um, another thing that comes to my mind is um, these antibiotics, they cannot distinguish this is the bad bacteria and this is the good one because obviously, as you mentioned as well, like uh, some of the microbes, they are our friends, they are friendly bacteria, we need them and there are millions of bacteria in our gut and we, we really need them uh, to for our digestion, to work the body properly. So antibiotics cannot distinguish between the good and the bad. So um, what would you say like um, over uh, prescribing and overuse of antibiotics? Because obviously if the good microbes are keep, keep being killed in the gut, it will cause uh, a problem for your body. The body will not work properly. And there is a, a gut and brain connection that's also important as well. So people will have some uh, mental health issues if their gut bacteria are not in, in the proper uh, form and shape. So, you know, in the antimicrobial resistance kind of, uh, when we discuss that, one other point which is very important is, not only finish the course, but what is left, we recommend that they should be given back to pharmacy. Okay. Don't keep it with you, or don't borrow it to somebody else because their infection may be completely different. Mm -hmm. People, if uh, one, this is one of the inappropriate use of antibiotics, mm -hmm. and it is not only leading to what we call as antimicrobial resistance, it is leading to another important issue, which we call as superbugs. Mm -hmm. Superbugs are, sometimes they are also called healthcare associated infections. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the kind of bugs, which as you mentioned, they live in our body, mm -hmm. For our own benefit, mm. they help in digestion, mm. they help in sometimes neutralizing the toxins in the body and also provide sometimes defense to the body. Yeah. But when there are antibiotics, certain antibiotics, they can make them more what we call as pathogenic, mm. which means they then turn against mm. and then produce what we call a super infection. Mm. And one of the commonest super infection is Clostridium difficile. Mm. So what is microbial resistance and how serious it can be? So antimicrobial resistance, microbial resistance is kind of the, as you say, uh, as I said earlier on, because we're not developing any new antibiotics. Mm -hmm. One of the properties of microbial agent is they evolve over time. Mm -hmm. So these antibiotics targeting, they target certain parts of the microbial agents mm -hmm. or bugs. Like some can attack their walls, some can attack their nuclei, some can attack their enzymes. And then the microbes also learn how to protect themselves from against the antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So they develop, they evolve over a period of time mm -hmm. and that, that is called microbial resistance. Mm -hmm. And that basically then means the antibiotic which was effective mm -hmm. now becomes less effective. Less effective. That's a very serious issue because then it is pushing us towards the pre-antibiotic time period, which means the simple surgical procedures can become very dangerous because we can't protect the patient from having infections. It can be lethal. Can, and they can lead to deaths. Mm. Things, for example, nowadays, lots of patients are receiving chemotherapy. They can become at risk of acquiring serious mm. infection mm. due to bugs become, becoming resistant. Transplant, transplant patient can become at risk. So we have to have a very vigilant approach towards appropriate use of antibiotics as we discussed. Responsible use of antibiotics. Yeah. Okay. So what are superbugs 
and they're linked to antibiotics. So superbugs, as we kind of alluded to it earlier on, there are bugs, they're big, they basically are bugs or bacteria. They live in our body, but sometimes they become more what we call as pathogenic, which means their ability to cause disease becomes more apparent or obvious due to the change in the internal host conditions or use of antibiotics. Um, so some of uh, the important ones are Clostridium difficile that lives in our gut. This is a bacteria lives in our gut. Uh, but some antibiotics, for example, the commonest one is augmentin. Mm -hmm. Then calendomycin. They make these bugs grow further and produce toxin and cause what we call as C. diff infection, or that which mainly results in diarrhea and so it can be very severe or, and serious gut infection as well. Then there is very, other very common is methicillin resistance Staph aureus or MRSA. The third most common ones is nowadays becoming more apparent is CPE. And this is commonly found in uh, its carbonase producing enterobacterials. But it is coming, becoming very apparent in patients who have recently been in hospital for, for let's say for surgery or they required to be on ICU. So that is again uh, one of the serious healthcare associated infection can be transmitted from patient to even their family members through the contacts. The fourth very important one is extended spectrum beta lactamase ESBL, very commonly causing UTIs in elderly group of patients and resistant to commonly use antibiotics. Oh, it's a scary list there. <laughs> yeah. It's a quite scary prospect that we have and we have got weapons but the, against these bugs, but they are becoming ineffective mm -hmm. due to improper use of these weapons. Yeah. So we need to be careful about this. Mm -hmm. So what are your recommendations? How can we prevent infection and uh, how can we stop its spread? Simple measures. They can, as we mentioned earlier on, the factors involved in spread of infection is the bug itself the environment where it lives and the host. So there are certain factors, for example, like hand hygiene. It is a simple measure. It prevents the spread of infection. Food hygiene, properly cooked food or, you know, reheated foods need to be careful about that. And then there are certain factors like cleaning of the environment, because if an infected person touches the surface, leaves the bugs there, need to be make sure we used it vigorously during COVID period. Mm. Then there are factors which are related to patient itself. So those who are infected, they need to be careful with regards to their coughing, sneezing hygiene. Mm. The other persons around them need to use personal protective equipment if required, like masks. Uh, so these are common things which we can use. And then there are Careful, we need to be careful about because there are some patients who could be in care home at homes. Their healthcare related materials, disposal, like tubes, like catheters, like needles, like sharps and syringes, because those can also be source of infection. The, the final one, which is very commonly is being recommended and we are all aware of it, is vaccinations. Use vaccinations like flu vaccines. Patients who are eligible for flu vaccine must get them to prevent from them from having the chances of flu and then serious infection. Okay. Finally, I want to know your thoughts. Um, you know, there is always a group of people who would think differently. Some people believe uh, because we are cleaning our surfaces and everything too much, so uh, it, it is going against us. So we need to be a little bit unclean. So to create our own resistance, <laughs> natural resistance against the bacteria and viruses. So what are your thoughts? <laughs> it's a bit of a controversial <laughs> kind of area. <laughs> As a medical prof personnel, I would advocate what I already said. Yeah. So making sure good hand hygiene. We would always get a low grade of exposure. A low grade, despite all these measures. These measures, as, as I said, they reduce significantly the chances of having infection. We will also continue to get these low grade of exposure, whether we are at home, we are going outside, traveling by train or by public transport, working at, you know, with other colleagues who may have an infection. 
so that our body will start developing that natural immunity okay thank you very much dr elias for joining me today thanks for your time thank you very much thanks viewers if you found today's episode useful you can share with your family and friends and if you haven't already make sure to subscribe to this channel thanks for watching